Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE. We're live at Dell Technologies World 23 at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante. There's been a lot of news in just the last, I would say, what, 26 hours or so, Dave. That's part of our industry. It really is. More great news came out this morning from Dell and NVIDIA. You're going to want to hear this if you're interested in generative AI, and who is it? One of our alumni is back with us, Varun Chabra, SVP Product Marketing at Dell Technologies, and Carrie Brisky joins us as well, VP AI Software Product Management at NVIDIA. It's great to have you both. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yep, thanks for having us. Talk a little bit about, generative AI is the hottest topic. I mean, we were just up here talking with Chuck Whitten and his kids are talking about it. Everyone's talking about it. Right. It's got massive potential to change the future of the world, the future of enterprise IT. Talk about some of that potential, but some of the challenges that customers are coming to Dell and NVIDIA to solve. Carrie, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I mean, obviously we've all felt the buzz about generative AI. Um, I think what's exciting is that a few of us have been working on generative AI for actually a couple years, and so I'm glad that we've all had that aha moment, the iPhone moment that just made sense to what, how can we integrate it into business applications. The thing is, is that um, I mentioned earlier today that not every enterprise can train a foundational model from scratch. It, I mean, it's mountains of data you have to curate, um, a large amount of compute, the um, algorithmic resources that you have to know to how to scale across thousands of GPUs, all these algorithms. So what we've done today with Project Helix is provide these pre-trained foundational models in various sizes with our NVIDIA Nemo framework, and then coupled with Dell, provide that to enterprises so you can get uh, just a jump start on your solving your business applications. And what's been the feedback from customers on Project Helix? Obviously announced this morning, Varun, what are some of the things that you're hearing yeah. on the show floor? Yeah, Lisa, I think, I think what we're finding as we talk to customers about generative AI in general is that as you would imagine with anything that's kind of hard to, hard to imagine but still early stage, uh, given how much hype there is about it, is that there is a spectrum of needs and people are on a journey here, right? So, so really the goal with Helix is to provide customers with help with generative AI enterprises wherever they are in the journey. If there are our most sophisticated customers who want to build a model from scratch, a generative model from scratch, we want to help them with that. If they're taking a, a foundational model that, that's included in the solution from NVIDIA and they want to tune it with their own proprietary data, we want to help them with that. Let's say they figured all of that stuff out, they've got their application ready, they've got their models ready, they want to deploy this at scale, maybe for an internal back office process or transforming their customer experience. We want to help them with that as well. What is the uh, training infrastructure? What is the inferencing infrastructure? How do you think about bringing all the components from Dell and NVIDIA together? Uh, it's, it's just a great, great, great place to get started. How did Project Helix start? Take us back when, yeah. you know, how did you, how did you yeah. guys get together on that? I, I can take a stab at it and carry. you can chime in. Look, I, you know, it, it may seem like, oh, this is a flash in the pan, but, but really the work on Project Helix started with the work that we're doing on the 16G Power Edge servers, right? So we have the XC9680 or the XC series in general, which you know, are really built for AI workloads. They, there was a close partnership with NVIDIA to design an eight-way server that has eight GPUs in it, and, and not, just, you know, not just slap the GPUs in there, how do you tune the performance, the networking, even cooling requirements, et cetera, to make sure that this can operate at scale. This work started, what, like two years ago, if not more? Yeah. Uh, and I think as we've been on that journey, we announced this at GTC this year, it's, you know, it's just the reaction has been so unbelievable. But it's also been very clear that we've got to do more for our customers. You know, customers are concerned about data privacy, data security, right? It could be their own privacy, um, their own privacy regulations or local privacy regulations, industry privacy regulations. Well, how do I get started? Where do I get started? Where, how do I get the expertise needed to bring these together? So that's really what Helix is doing. It's taking the work we've already done together and really packaging that up so that we reduce the friction for our customers jointly. So if it weren't for ChatGPT, would you have announced at Dell Tech World, part A, part B is, would anybody, anybody have paid attention? So, Chat GPT, I don't know yeah, what that right. is, but I'm <laughs> not, not familiar with that. I mean, I think it's smart that you, you have to have, it's the year of AI, but would you think you would have announced? I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, look, the, the work for 9680 has been happening for a long time. I think what's unique about Helix is we're taking the, the needs we're hearing from the customers because, you know, Chat GPT has made it front and center for our customers. So I think that's the reason why we're calling it project, because we want to make sure we incorporate that feedback in there as well. 
Uh, I mean, the 9680 was going to happen regardless. Like we know that was going to happen. And, and AI workloads have yeah. only been growing, right? So if, since computer vision, you had the ImageNet moment, you've had the BERT moment, superhuman uh, tests on the glue scores for natural language processing. So this is just this, then we had recommendation engines for neural recommendation engines, and now generative AI. And actually, generative AI has been around for a couple of years as well too. It just was that flip moment with that everyone understood it. Yeah. But uh, you know, we've had generative speech. We've had large language gender models, styles, yeah, yeah. we've had large language models. Yeah. So I think that, yes, of course we would have announced it anyway, and with the NEMO framework, NEMO framework has been around for a couple years, so we, we actually accelerate and help train in and for every single type of AI workload. But, but generative AI is just really important the right The ChatGPT hype has been a gift, yes. because I think a yes. lot more yes. people pay, for, yes. pay attention. So we were talking earlier, Carrie, about I watched that uh, interview between Jensen and Iliad. Is it Iliad? Yeah, yeah. Amazing, you should watch it. Uh, he's the co-founder of OpenAI, and he was talking about how completion was the magic sauce of, of what they developed. And you were explaining, yeah, that's cool, but there's a lot of other, can you explain that and how, how, how it's different from what Project Helix is? Uh, well, so, so the completion is part of the model, right? So that's what you're generating that next step, that next character, that next protein, that next molecule, that next part of speech, of voice. So that you're, that's a completion API. So when you're talking about chat, uh, and the reinforcement learning through human feedback of when you provide an answer to somebody and you're able to hone and say, what type of conversation would you like to have? Would you like to talk more technical? Would you like to uh, be able to give short, curt answers? Would you like me to elaborate? So all of that is fed back in through that reinforcement learning of human feedback and that's, what's so, that's what makes it so um, important of, of chatting. And then there's also one other thing about the chain of thought. These large language models, the larger the model, we, it's been proven that the, they uh, improve the perplexity scores of being able to keep that conversation going. Of what, was, what was the thought that you just had? How am I continuing that? How can I have this uh, multi-turn conversation keep going? And that's the chat aspect of completion and generative. And, and just to add a little bit about Helix and how that ties into this, Helix is really about building a horizontal platform, right? And if customers want to deploy uh, an LLM, they can do that. If they want to deploy a diffusion model for image generation, they can do that, right, or anything in between. It could be, as Carrie was educating me, um, something around healthcare. Um, you know, it, 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 it's meant to really enable the use cases and the innovation that we know is coming in the enterprise that will be domain specific and cater towards very, very specific use cases. Talk a little bit about, you know, building a generative AI cluster, infrastructure, software, is really difficult. Dell and NVIDIA taking out a lot of that complexity for organizations. One of the things Michael Dell said yesterday in his keynote was that for companies that haven't already, are, are not already working with AI, they're already behind. Is Project Helix, can it be an accelerant for businesses that are going, help guys, we've got to do more than dip our toe in the water. Yes, I, look, I, I think the, the, the thing to remember about Helix is that the infrastructure from Dell, the software from Dell, the NVIDIA software, the NVIDIA GPU accelerators are available to customers today. Helix is really about bringing all of those together, creating blueprints, tailoring infrastructure and software and tuning it specifically for use cases depending on wherever customers are. So it's really built, Lisa, as you said, for accelerating the journey, providing the expertise. Um, Carrie, anything to add? Yeah, I would just say that Project Helix provides freedom. Right, because a lot of uh, enterprises are being held into clouds or cloud services, and now when you're able to keep that privacy, data security on prem, or every, and have, you get the choice, and freedom is choice. So I want to follow up on that, because yesterday I heard Satya, we listened to him on a keynote, talking about laptops, could be a you know, target. Jensen today said, yeah, a lot of this stuff has to be done on prem. So part of me said, is that just because they're in Dell's house and they're yeah. being nice, or is there a shift going on where, and I have talked to a lot of uh, HPC folks in the last you know, week or so, because uh, uh, ISC is happening in Hamburg, and I interviewed a bunch of folks uh, before, and, and they're like running you know, half a million cores on-prem. They, they, they have yeah. no choice. But, but, but is there a shift going on? Is, will, will AI perpetuate, in your view, a shift, not a repatriation, but maybe a rebalancing of where people put work? Uh, Opinions on that? I, I mean, the, the way I, I think about it is, in, in some respects, Gen AI is no different from a lot of other workloads that, that, that customers are deploying today. Depending on their specific needs, you know, data privacy regulations, performance requirements, there's going to be a mix of infrastructure and where it's located, right? And it's not just about cloud versus data center, Dave. It's also about the edge, right, and how the edge plays into it. I, I mean, I, I think really it would be foolish to pretend otherwise. It's, it's really going to be a, a broad spectrum. 
and certain workloads will be predisposed to running in data centers, certain portions of the workloads will be at the edge, and I, I, I definitely think the cloud will play a role in that as well. I echo that. I mean, I think everyone's kind of gotten over that I would never put my data in the cloud. People have, and they will, and they will continue to do so, but again, I just meant about, it's freedom, freedom of choice of where you want to do. You don't have to sacrifice um, certain privacy concerns for one solution or the other. You can now have it wherever you want it. But, but to your point about the edge, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I've written about this, is that most of the, the, the AI, or much of it anyway, and the spending is, is, is tr you know, modeling in the cloud. Yes. And we've said, I think we were too conservative in our predict predictions, going to end a decade, it's going to be mostly AI inferencing at the edge. So yeah. compress that by yeah. seven years based on my prediction. And it's happening right in front of us. You know, and a lot of it's going to be this too, I get it. It's not just going to be on you know, big million dollar you but know, boxes. I mean, but if you look at the, if you look at the we're, we're already there. Like if you look at form factors that we have in our PowerEdge line and VxRail uh, storage, we've got a lot of form factors that don't cost anywhere near that, right? I mean, if you think about things like the XR4000, as Gil was talking about it today, these, these are much smaller form factors for things that have traditionally been much larger because there's going to be that interplay between whether it's edge and data center and edge and cloud and edge and both that allows you to offload some of that stuff there, but it also does mean a huge preponderance and almost like, I think you said freedom, I would say democratization of, of, of this wherever you want to deploy it. And you know, Jensen touched on that, again, I love this talk, he said, the thing is the app is miraculous, it is, as an API it can connect to anything and it's a universal programming language called human. I mean, how powerful is that? And we can all touch it and use the term, we've talked about this, the data center is going to be called an AI factory. Yeah. Like, wow, okay. Love that. Yep. That is, I, I think it's, it feels certainly like we're entering a new era and it's going to have impacts on productivity. Everybody wants to talk about job loss. You can't protect the past from the future. Uh, but, but what are you hearing from customers in terms of, do you think that this is going to bring a productivity boom, like maybe not as much as the industrial revolution, but like we've never seen in the modern sort of computing era. What do you guys think about I that? Say absolutely, no doubt. I mean, even if you know, we're talking about the ways, Varun and I were talking about the ways we use uh, generative AI internally at each of our companies, and just even for say ser uh, IT service tickets, each of our IT service attendants is saving seven minutes for every single ticket that we that it, per day. So that's a lot of tickets per day. It's a lot of minutes saved, and so th that's just one productivity gain, one small, like one small drop in, a, in an ocean, right, of the amount of productivity gains that we can get for all the different use cases for generative AI. And, 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 and I think just to add, I think productivity is absolutely a place to go to, and, and we will see a lot of initial benefits there, but one of the things that I think about is if you, as, as Jen Felch was talking about today, as you open up these to not just developers, these, these language models to rank and file employees, you know, you, people can now become coders when they couldn't do that, right? So maybe some employee in, a, in an enterprise had an idea about some really cool thing, but they were limited by their ability to code. Well, that, that creativity, that business acumen is now unleashed, right? So, so if you think about the, the productivity is one angle, but the creativity and, and new outcomes, and I, it's, it's a little bit of a Insights, cliche, but it's yeah. really hard to imagine yeah. for us where this is going to go. It just yeah. feels, though, as you said, it's, it, we're on the precipice of something really, really big. Well, on that coding, because the, 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 the tongue-in-cheek uh, meme on, the, on Twitter is, time it takes me to write the code, like instant, and then time it takes me to debug it. But, but how real is that today? I mean, I, I have no doubt. It's like, this is like the first GUI we ever saw. It's like dial-up. You know, five years from now, we're going to be like, wow. We're going to be blown away today. It's going to just be but, but how real is that today? Can, are, are, are developers today using AI and is it making them you know, significantly more productive? Absolutely, you have, you have text to code, code to text, code completion, um, so it's, it's happening today. Yeah. Yeah. I, have a, I have a friend who's in a startup, who has his own startup. He uh, used to spend all his time on Substack. He said he just uses a ChatGPT premium subscription now and, and you know, that's like. So he doesn't have to hunt and peck for the right syntax and, yeah. and, and, and the and right and code uh, fragment. Yeah, yeah, and we're doing that internally at Dell as, as, as Jen was showing you today. We're opening up these models for, for our own developers and we certainly think that that's going to happen in other places as well. But to that point of hunting and pecking, um, you don't want one model to rule them all. That's why it's so important that every enterprise needs their own generative model right. because that one model is just a, a one view of the world. Uh, and so you need your own 
purview or aperture on the world and maybe specialize in you and your data and your business because yeah. uh, it might be, it's just a general knowledge of one thing or a little bit of everything, but just not a subject matter expert in, in one That's great right. thing. That's and, right, and I think that the, even, even as Jen was showing today in the keynote, the marketplace that we internally have for developers, it has you know, open AI options, it has on-prem LLMs, you could do like Llama, you could do foundational models from NVIDIA. It is going to be a kind of a multi-model world, I guess, not modal, but multi-model world as well. Yeah. I have three on my laptop. I have, I have Bard, I have ChatGPT, which I pay for, uh, and, and then I have the Cube AI, That's right. which, That's right. which we're trying to perfect, and I compare yeah. the answers. A lot of times the Cube AI answers That's are right. better. That's right. And I can get, you know, what Varun said, I can get a clip of it. And it's because you have your data, yeah. right? Tuned for that, versus the other ones you're talking about are general purpose models, uh, which will be good for certain use cases, but the use cases that you guys have, your own data is going to help deliver a much better result for you and your customers. Yeah, and, and in my head, I'm like, okay, if, if I don't want to leak my IP, yep because somebody else is going to be able to do this. Uh, how can I add more, yeah. uh, enrich my data set? I mean, it's just mind blowing. Well, it's not just enriching your data set. I think that's a great segue into guardrails, right? It's being able to provide guardrails for LLMs. You keep it topical on the topics that you care about, that it's, it's uh, safety, it's not giving any toxic responses or unwanted answers, and then secure that it's not going off to some remote application and installing some malicious code. So being able to provide guardrails to large language models or to your cube app is going to be really, really important. Yeah, very cool. My last question for you guys is for, for every business that is looking to power the entire life cycle of generative AI and blow our minds in the next year, the value prop. Why Dell and NVIDIA? What do you guys say? Look, I, I, think, I think the biggest value prop I would say is uh, the, the combination of of the infrastructure and the software, um, you know, the accelerators and the expertise. I think the expertise is a really, really important place to start. Y you know, you'll be surprised at how many customers have, the, the basic questions that customers have, right? It's still early days and, and I think sometimes the conversations are where do I start, right? So, so the, the expertise and the fact that this is not new stuff that, you know, we, we've been working on this for years, I think that, that combined knowledge and combined expertise, I would say, is the biggest differentiator, but Carrie, from your point of view, yeah, just being able to have a great partner. They take it to enterprises. Yeah. I mean, NVIDIA is a small company. We need a partner like Dell to really help uh, just bring our platform and democratize AA, like Varun said. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for joining Dave and me. Great Cannot stuff. wait to us. see yeah. the direction project Helix goes in by next year. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. having, having us. us. Yeah. All right, our pleasure. For our guests and Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. Up next, Caitlin Gordon is back with us with Maki Kapoor. They're going to be talking all things Apex, what the future looks like, ground to cloud, cloud to ground, air traffic control, you name it. Stick around, they'll be right here. Mm -hmm.